Welcome to Spirits of Whiskey. We explore the wide world of whiskey through the many colorful personalities who make it, promote it, write about it, and more. With each podcast, Carrie Moynihan, a certified bourbon steward and bartender, and yours truly, Philip Dovar, director of the Cocktail Collection, interview whiskey's most important names. From high-profile makers, blenders, and ambassadors, to out-of-the-way innovators and remote pioneers. Join us as we discover the people and elements that give the water of life its spirit. It is Whiskey Wednesday, May 26, 2021, and you're listening to episode 43. Today, we speak with Dr. Don Livermore about Canadian whiskey. But first, stay tuned for this week's Whiskey Chronicles. Spirits of Whiskey explores the wide world of whiskey through high-profile and out-of-the-way makers, blenders, writers, ambassadors, innovators, and pioneers. And we've been traveling the world virtually to bring these people and their whiskey journeys to you. We realize just how many great stories we've put aside to share with you at a later date. And that date is here. Spirits of Whiskey is offering access to its new VIP content page to loyal listeners and whiskey lovers who want more. And when it comes to whiskey, who doesn't want more? For as little as 99 cents a month, you can have access to videos related to topics discussed on past podcasts, as well as our new series, The Malting Floor. Sign up now to become a supporter at anchor.fm slash spirits hyphen of hyphen whiskey. That's whiskey with an E. Click on the support button and select the contribution level that's right for you. Once you've submitted your payment information, just visit our website, spiritsofwhiskey.com, to create your personal VIP access account. We can't wait to see you in the VIP lounge. Join us. Amidst the COVID-19 pandemic, cocktails to go have been a lifeline for many bars and restaurants throughout the United States. But the loosening of rules governing these sales were intended to be temporary. Now that so many Americans are getting vaccinated and businesses in more and more cities, counties, and states are operating with fewer restrictions, the question is, will cocktails to go stick around after the coronavirus lockdown lifts? According to Today.com, cocktails to go may become a permanent fixture in some parts of the country. Prior to the COVID-19 outbreak, more than two dozen states allowed restaurants to sell beer and wine, but not mixed drinks, on a takeaway basis. Since the onset of the lockdown, however, 11 states, Arkansas, Florida, Georgia, Iowa, Kentucky, Montana, Ohio, Oklahoma, Texas, West Virginia, and Wisconsin already have made, or will soon make, these new takeaway drink regulations permanent. Other states, including Delaware, Maine, Virginia, and Washington, meanwhile, have extended their loosened cocktails-to-go rules to at least 2022. And legislative bodies in Kansas, Minnesota, Missouri, Nebraska, New Hampshire, New Jersey, New York, Oregon, and Pennsylvania are considering bills that would legalize takeaway cocktails permanently. But what about California? Home to nearly 40 million residents, this U.S. state, by far the nation's most populous, makes waves across the country whenever it dips a toe in the legislative waters. According to the L.A. Times, California very well could make cocktails to go an everyday affair. And State Senator Bill Dodd, Democrat Napa, introduced a bill that would do just that. It passed in the California Senate on May 10th and is currently in the hands of the State Assembly. If the lower chamber approves the bill, it'll be forwarded to Governor Gavin Newsom's desk and be signed into law. For more details, visit spiritsofwhiskey.com for today's show notes. Next, we move north of the United States and speak with Dr. Don Livermore of Hiram Walker & Sons in Windsor, Ontario, Canada. Stay with us. Hey. Do you like whiskey, food, and adventure? I do. Hi, I'm Carrie. I'm Philip. I'm Louise. I'm the chef. Chef Louise Leonard, as in our World of Wheezy segment host here on the podcast, and Whiskey, a Chef's Journey. That chef. That's right. The project that started this very podcast. The series stars our very own chef, Louise Leonard, winner of Emmy-winning The Taste on ABC. And explores and connects the worlds of whiskey and food, city by city, country by country. Would you like to see this spirited culinary adventure on a TV near you? Well, you can by helping us finish the pilot episode through our crowdfunding campaign. For more information, including behind-the-scenes photos, videos, and incentives. And to make a pledge, visit our website, whiskeyachefsjourney.com. Or search for our campaign, Whiskey A Chef's Journey, at gofundme.com. That's gofundme.com now. Well, I I think it's a cheers to that. (laughs) Let's. Cheers. Cheers.
Our guest today on Spirits of Whiskey is Dr. Don Livermore. Don is Master Blender at Hiram Walker and Sons Limited in Windsor, Ontario, Canada. Welcome to Spirits of Whiskey, Don. Yes, welcome. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, excited to be here and certainly talk about Canadian whiskey. As you know, you'll find out I'm quite passionate about it. So, And you're celebrating your silver anniversary, 25 years working in it. Yeah, just over a month ago at my 25-year anniversary. And can you believe it? When I started, I didn't even have email. I had to handwrite all the results. I didn't have a spreadsheet. And I'll often say, well, if that's what it was like 25 years ago as a blender, what's 25 years from now going to be? That's going to be the scary part, right? Yeah. Act two. Yeah. So, Don, <laughs> we usually start these lovely chats off with talking about your whiskey journey from when you were a child. Did you ever dream that you would be into such a thing? And then when you finally started getting into whiskey, what was your first whiskey experience? And then how did that progress to 25 years working where you are? Well, as a child, I don't think I really was thinking about making whiskey. I, I don't think as a child, <laughs> I was really expo exposed. I hope not. <laughs> We've talked to some Kentuckians who grew up literally on the shop floor. <laughs> well, my dad was a teacher. My mom was a music teacher and then eventually a stay-at-home mom. And I lived in a small farming community of 300 people. I went to uh, Listowel High School. And if anybody knows the show Letter Kenny, if you know or aware of it, it's a very Canadian-ish type of show. That's the high school that's based off of that is Listowel, Ontario. Hmm. But I have strong agricultural roots. So making whiskey probably was not of the forefront. So from a small agricultural community, I really didn't have aspirations of making whiskey, nor did it really run in the family. But certainly education was key to the my parents, obviously, they were teachers. And I knew probably at a young age, being in such a rural area of Ontario, that I'd have to go to university and leave home. And I did at 18 and went to a, what we call the University of Waterloo. And I was more inspired by a great 10 biology teacher, actually, to take biology. And that's what I gravitated towards for my university and my undergrad degree. And once I took my first microbiology course, that was it. My thought really leaving university was to probably manufacture drugs. <laughs> I don't know if you realize a lot of your drugs and, and I mean, it's very prevalent today with COVID, right? Right. With the immunizations and things like that. That's probably where I thought I would land. And I thought that's where the future was for me. But, you know, I got lucky in a sense that uh, my first job exiting university was working at a agriculture research farm, working on a microorganism and, and at that time on apple trees. And I met a individual there. Her dad actually had worked for Hiram Walker. She reached out and contacted me about a few months after she had left to work here. And she said, Don, they're looking for a microbiologist. Are you interested in working for a whiskey distiller? And yeah, yeah, I'll throw my resume in. Why not? Making alcohol, making drugs, kind of the same principles, same concepts. They make people feel good or better. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's right. I mean, really, it's the same concept. Or worse. <laughs> yeah. And uh, that was 25 years ago. And I moved here for the job and I got it. And the company saw some talent in me, I hope. And they sent me away to school at the University of Harriet Watt University. Nice which is in Edinburgh, Scotland. Uh, mm -hmm. If anyone knows, that's one of the very few English-speaking schools that does a brewing and distilling degree. So I did my master's while working here, and then I completed a PhD in 2012. Wow. Yeah. So I'm one of very few in the world as a master blender that has a PhD in brewing and distilling. We've hosted any number of guests who have had at least the MSc from Harriet Watt. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a very, very relevant to what I do. And, and uh, I took it the one step further. And I know when I was doing my PhD, I was really looking for a method to measure the quality of a barrel. Because that's one of the biggest struggles as a Canadian whiskey producer is we buy a for here, it was over 20,000 barrels, once used bourbon barrels a year, and they could come into various qualities. And it's probably one of the biggest risks I face as a blender is, how do you know that quality? Has it been a four-year or has it been a 20-year right, in this barrel? Right. And, yeah. and what, what I was trying to do was calibrate infrared sensors to measure wood extracts that would come off the surface of a barrel within 30 seconds. Wow. So I was able to do that in my PhD. I had to destroy a barrel to do it, to be able to get the infrared sensor to touch the surface of the barrel. But in practicality, it can work. And that's kind of my background as an education. And uh, the same way, the funny part, the same week I defended my PhD was the same week I got promoted as a master blender. Nice. One of the best <laughs> years of my, or one of my best weeks of my life, actually. And it's just been kind of a whirlwind since then. That was 2012. So that's a little bit of the background. PhD and MB. Yeah. 
Yeah, I really wasn't into whiskey till I started well, working here. I'm a typical Canadian boy, beer, drink beer. I mean, <laughs> that's what you drank in university and maybe had a whiskey here and there, but I uh, really, really didn't get into it till working at this facility. Yeah. About wood. Mm. Wood is, I mean, it's critical to the quality of aged whiskey, but it's particularly critical, I would imagine, to a blender who's sitting waiting for things to exit the cask so that he can do his work. Talk to us about that. Yeah. For me, I think wood is very important. It, if you've ever had an opportunity, certainly search my name on the internet and look for the Canadian whiskey flavor wheel. And it's this mindset, Philip, that there are three things really that drive flavor in the whiskey. And it's either the yeast, which is your fermentation, it's your grain, or the wood in itself. And those are the places I can draw flavor from. And depending on the style of whiskey that I'm trying to make, some whiskeys tend to be a little more wood forward. I got a brand called JP Weiser's Red Letter that we age in brand new virgin oak barrels and I want to be more wood forward. Lot 40 is another brand we age in brand new barrels because it's so hot rye forward that I need to balance the nice sweet vanilla notes against the spicier rye. So we can draw flavor in from that. But if you want to emphasize more of a grain forward whiskey, I'll use used Canadian whiskey barrels. Or in the case of a bourbon barrel, I'd use a once used bourbon barrel and that tends to give a nice beautiful dried fruit note to your whiskey. So there are plays around barrels and what you can do in terms of drawing in flavor. And it really comes down to the who you're trying to market it against. And it is one play, but there's also other places you can bring in flavor just equally, if not more. Quite honestly, I think yeast is undervalued. Oh yeah, I do too. Yeah. And I just hope the day I can sit down in a bar on a stool someday and talk about the yeast train I used in my whiskey. But today I don't think it quite resonates with consumers. It might to you guys. But to the general consumer, it's a tough conversation to have. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Well, we have a goodly number of geeks in our listening audience. So, you know, whale away. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. You've already touched on one of the drams that we're going to be drinking today. And since we have so many, I think we better get started. Otherwise, I won't be able to walk later. Yeah. When we have this many, we tend to taste throughout the interview. And I think Gooderham and Warts is up first. Gooderham and Warts. I think that's a great place to start. Gooderham and Warts. Before we start, could you tell our listeners about the fundamental difference between Canadian and American whiskeys? particularly as it pertains to mash bills or lack thereof. <laughs> so Canadian whiskey, what I like to mention, it's, it's the opposite of bourbon, at least it tends to be. But all we have to do is be made of grain, fermented, aged, and distilled in Canada, aged in a wooden barrel of less than 700 liters for a minimum of three years and a minimum of 40% alcohol. So they don't tell us what type of grain we use or what mash bill. Wow. That's up to me. That's my job as a blender. Cool. They don't tell me how to distill it, column still, pot still, combinations thereof, or whatever strength I want to distill it to. That's my choice as a blender. You can concentrate up flavors that way or you can strip them out. Depends which way you want to distill it. And the other thing is they just tell us we have to age it in wood. So it doesn't have to be new wood. It doesn't have to be even oak, as long as it's less than 700 liters from a minimum of three years. Mm -hmm. What I always say, that makes Canadian whiskey the most innovative, creative an adaptable style of whiskey there is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes I'll poke on the term that makes Canadian whiskey diverse. Isn't that Canada? Indeed. There's one definition. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's one definition. And it gives you the latitude and the creativity and the adaptability. So the larger producers, as you're trying to refer to, Philip, don't use a mash bill. We can if we want. Our choice is there, but we tend to. There, there's a tradition. There's a tradition of distilling the grains separately and then blending. Yeah, the tradition was a mash bill way, way, way back in the day. But as it evolved probably into the late 1800s, they started fermenting things separately. Mm -hmm. They really started fermenting things separately. And the reason being is it's easier to innovate in the long term, right? I don't know what percentage of rye you want today or tomorrow or the next day. And we can adapt to what the marketplace is looking for. And the Gooderham and Warts is very good style to showcase that because it is a four grain whiskey where the grains have been fermented, distilled and aged separately. So it contains corn, rye, wheat, and barley, not of the equal proportion of, of, of various different balances. So it wants to showcase that sort of thing. It was also made in spirit of who Gooderham and Warts were. Mm -hmm. They're one of the original pioneers of the Canadian whiskey industry where they've settled in downtown Toronto and they were grain merchants and grain millers. That's why they actually came to Canada. Okay. There were two brother-in-laws that came to Canada as millers. And then they kind of defaulted getting into distilling because it was a natural thing to do as millers during that time period. And I wanted to make a whiskey in spirit of who they were. So let's pick on the grains. And so that was the other thing is, and the fun part of it, you'll find I have a little bit of a cheesy personality, is the strength of alcohol in this one is 44.4%. Mm -hmm. So being four grains, 
I wanted to hit that 44.4. Our translation, 88.8 proof. <laughs> we wanted to bring that out. And there's a method to my madness because at higher strengths, grainier and woodier characters are going to come out. At lower strengths, that's what we call opening it up. As you guys would know, that's where the fruity and floral notes come out. So mm -hmm. if we're looking at this one, it's going to have a lot of character to it. I certainly get a nice fruity note as I'm sitting here in my office nosing it today. Very wheat for nice bready, that Tim Hortons character, <laughs> breadiness to it. <laughs> that right? Yes. <laughs> and uh, cheers, A. Eh? I'm going to go out and get donuts after this. Yes. Cheers. <laughs> cheers, A. Eh? We say A. Uh, get cheers, A. Eh? Yes. A cheers. Mm. Mm. And I find right away you get a breadiness. That's the wheat. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then a nuttiness, you get the barley. And 30 seconds in, I find I get the sweetness. That's your corn. Mm -hmm. And then the finish, the warm through the chest. The Canadian hug, I'm sure you've heard people call it the Kentucky hug. We call it the Canadian hug. You can always tell how much rye is in the blend by how long that sticks there. Okay. So whiskeys, right. we'll try a few here that have less rye in it, and you'll notice the difference, how long it sticks in that chest. So this is one of those, if you will, post-facto mash bills. All four grains are distilled separately and then blended, correct? That's right. Okay. And they're distilled in different manners. Some of them are just single column distilled. The corn is double column distilled, so it makes a light base whiskey. And then the wheat that we've put into this blend is further pot distilled, which concentrates off that nice bready flavor that you're getting, mm -hmm. that, that nice hit up front. How long has this one aged? It's got various ages in it, so it's probably got five to nine-ish in it, depending okay. on availability and inventory. As you know, forecasting in the whiskey industry is a challenge to us, so we kind of try to hit the five to nine-year range with something like this. Okay. Yeah. Now, we have a number of brands before us. Hiram Walker is a house of brands more than it is a branded house. You have numerous brands in the portfolio. We're looking today at, I believe, all of your whiskey brands. Uh, well, we do have a Hiram Walker brand. There is a brand. Ah, okay. All right. I got it here. It's only sold in Canada, so that's why we're not probably talking about it. It's sure. called a Hiram Walker <laughs> Special Old. Okay. That's his original recipe dating back to 1858, actually. Oh, okay. So yeah, we do have some Hiram Walker names here. So what we try to represent with some of the brands is just the style, like a house style, right? Mm -hmm. So we know what Gutter Hammond works would probably have an appeal to a bourbon drinker. So if anyone in the audience who likes bourbons, I really, really find bourbon drinkers gravitate towards this brand, okay. whereas some of the others may, may or may not so. So that's, that's kind of the idea behind it. And some of the brands, ones that you've acquired and some others you've developed? Both. Mm -hmm. Both. Some of them have been acquired around Prohibition. Most people believe that Canadian whiskey grew because of Prohibition. Prohibition actually was a harm to our industry. Uh -huh. It really was hard. We actually lost your customer. You actually lost your, your distribution network. And if you really think about it, I know you guys are in the beverage alcohol. When you lose your customers, especially after this year, what happens, right? <laughs> Not good things, right? Yeah, right. So, and that, that would have been like prohibition to the Canadian whiskey producers. And one of the misnomers out there is what grew Canadian whiskey more than anything else was the year 1861 to 1865. Are you a history buff? Do you know what was going on? Yeah, that means something to us. The Civil War, yes. The war between the states. Yeah, that's right. So you got the American North <laughs> fighting the America South. Do you think they're going to sell each other whiskey? No, not above the board. No, no not probably not. Yeah, no. <laughs> not in good terms. And the men would have went to war. Yes. <laughs> they would have shut down the distilleries because they would have needed it for food, right? Mm -hmm. Right. And also whiskey was the most popular drink. So that left an opportunity for the Canadian whiskey producers to grow. That was the biggest growth in Canadian whiskey history was the American Civil War. And uh -huh. it kind of makes sense which, once you talk about it. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Because production, you know, in times of war, factories get put on wartime footing, which means they're producing things other than consumable spirits. That, that's correct. And, and Canada took uh, opportunity of that. And you'll see a lot of these distilleries, you'll say the founding year to it, like Weiser's and Gooderham and Warts and uh, Corby was a whiskey at the time and Iron Walker was all just predating that Civil War era. Mm -hmm. So what you're saying is during Prohibition, rolling barrels west across the frozen Detroit River was not sufficient to make up the difference. Oh, no, no, no. That's, well, no, we'd roll it. No, it's rolling at north. Rolling at north. Or south of the U.S. border here. Okay. Well, I, yeah, this I know, but across that, the Detroit River. <laughs> yes. To Detroit. Just to, <laughs> there's a bridge there now, of course. but Yeah, in a tunnel. Yes, yes. But yeah, most. Well, here's your trivial pursuit question. Which Canadian city is south of the U.S. border? And if you actually look, get out your iPhone, look at it. Windsor, Ontario is south of Detroit. Yeah, yeah. A little bit. Brings whole new meaning to the song from Journey, South Detroit, right? <laughs> south Detroit. Yeah. What a band. What a band. <laughs> So anyway, yeah, Windsor is quite southerly as regards the U.S. Yeah, it is. And it's the northern U.S., yes. It's more southerly than it's south of much of the northern United States. Yeah, and it, it's even as south as northern California. If you actually look at the map, we're on the 44th parallel. 
Mm -hmm. And one of the interesting things about this region is you're in the middle of the continent. You've got these big, fresh bodies of water that's around you. We get an interesting heating cooling cycle that really, really brings home some flavors that can develop in your cask in our aging warehouse because we don't temperature control them. And it's interesting if you go into our aging warehouse today, I've actually taken a temperature probe of putting into a cask and I've seen them get down to minus five degrees Celsius, which is about 20 Fahrenheit. And a barrel gets below the freezing point of water over our winter season. It's a very interesting. And that, yet the, it gets so warm here in the summer, we get that humidity effect from the Great Lakes. It'll get up to 82, 83 degrees in a cask. It is an interesting heating, cooling temperature cycle. You have Great Lakes on three sides of you and those Great Lakes have their own climates. They're so large. Yeah. And we get ice going down our river in Detroit every winter. And it's an interesting cycle. And for us in our evaporative losses, we'll lose about 3% a year in our aging inventory. So our warehouses house 1.6 million barrels. So it's of significant size. I always translate it into the size of 132 hockey arenas. <laughs> uh, shall we look at the second one here? Yes. The J.P. Weiser's Triple Barrel Rye. Triple barrel rye. So what I'd like to describe with this, rye is a grain that's very hearty. So it'll grow in sandy soil and rocky soil. It actually won't grow past 25 degrees Celsius. So that's roughly about 70, 70 degrees. It grows in that Canadian climate. So a lot of the original Canadian whiskey producers would take local grain and would have been corn and they would have double distilled it to make light whiskey, but they utilize their properties around their distilleries and the grain that grew in our region was rye. Rye is the spice. It's the DNA to Canadian whiskey. Now, the grain rye, I really want to focus on this. It has a lot of fiber to it on the shell, on the husk of it. If you look at the grain fiber, it is made of cellulose, hemicellulose, and lignin, right? Cellulose and hemicellulose often, I would say, is like bricks. Lignin is the cement that holds it together. And I know you visit distilleries. If you go inside of a distillery, you're constantly heating, cooking, right? Rye, by far, has the highest lignin level in comparison to any other grain. Okay has a lot of cement. So when you're heating and cooking, you're busting those molecules apart, right? Mm -hmm. Rye has a lot of lignin, you're busting it apart. And what happens is you create a lot of these flavor molecules in your whiskey. Mm -hmm. So I always tell people, don't ask me how much rye is in your whiskey. You should be asking me how much 4-ethylgiacol is in your whiskey. I'll, I'll get on that. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, and I ought to say lignin's the world's most unappreciated molecule. It's more flavor to whiskey than you could actually appreciate it. I know you drink scotch. Uh -huh. It's been known to happen. <laughs> yeah. What is peat? It's plant material that's been degraded. And so it's degraded lignin yes. mm -hmm. that they burn to get on the shell of the barley. And hence, it comes through in the flavors in your whiskey. It's like the same with rye. Mm -hmm. So you're looking at bringing and busting apart lignin, bringing home those spicy characters. So the J.P. Weiser's Triple Barrel Rye, we blended in. Uh, the majority of this whiskey does contain rye. Mm -hmm. So when you know that you're going to get a, a nice lilac note to it, mm -hmm. you're getting ginger. I get some white pepper, maybe black pepper. I'm not Meg's nose to this. So this is a rye forward whiskey. Sits at 45%. We do put a little bit of wheat in it just to soften it up a little bit. And the triple barrel means we use three types of casks for the blend. So that's one of the components. When I make a recipe for blending, I'll have used Canadian whiskey barrels. Once used bourbon barrels to give a dried fruit note and new oak. Again, that nice vanilla note will counterbalance that heavier rye. Cheers. Cheers, Abe. Mm -hmm. The high lignin content. Is that one of the reasons that rye, 100% rye, is notoriously difficult to work with? Yeah, it, it, lignin and busting apart, it gets sticky. It has a molecule in it called glucan. Glucan is a sticky type of sugar. It does make it very, very difficult to work with. Inside the Canadian whiskey category, we're allowed to use commercial enzymes to it. So if you know when and where to add a commercial en enzyme from a gluconase, they call it, we can actually thin it right out. So if you know what you're doing, Philip, basically, <laughs> you can handle the stickiness. If you don't know and understand the enzymatic technologies, that where rye can certainly become a challenge to someone. Okay. All right. Yeah. We have another brand. Lot number 40. Yeah. Presumably, this is a brand you've developed in-house? Yeah. So just a couple of points on lot 40. And I'm going to talk about fermentation here, too. I think we talked a little bit about yeast as being the underappreciated part of our business, right? We are brewers first, as you would know. So we can control the pH, the temperature, the oxygen levels, the grain content to convince yeast to make fruity, floral, green grass, soapy, sulfur notes. That's what brewers will do. That's what beer people do. They can change all these th types of things to create lots of different flavors in their whiskey. So when you ultimately end up with a mash, yeast has made all this flavor. 
You got all this flavor coming from the lignin from your grain. So the thing is, we'll put everything through a column still first, right? That's the beer still. That's what you guys think of when you're thinking of bourbon. So rule of thumb is this. You put the mash in at the top of the still. Mash falls through the holes of the still. You put steam at the bottom. Alcohol is boiling 0.78 degrees Celsius. Water's boiling point is 100 degrees Celsius. So all the alcohol vapor is going to the top. You condense it to a liquid that's about 70% alcohol. What you really need to know is one pass through a beer still. You keep the fruity flavor, the floral flavor, the green grass flavor, the soapy flavor, and the grain flavor that you used. A very big, full, robust white dog, right? Mm -hmm. We call it high wines in Canada. White dog as for your bourbon brothers. Machine for your Irish. Yeah, so the stills are made of copper, so it pulls out the sulfur notes the yeast has made. Right. Right, it salts out on the tray. I'm going to lift you on a secret. We've all used copper we have for 10 centuries. (laughs) <laughs> yes. And we, we love to put it on bottles as whiskey producers, copper distilled. So that's largely how J.P. Weiser's rye is made. The second whiskey you just had, it has that single column distilled rye. We can further take that rye whiskey and put it into a pot still. So we do one more step to do this is pot stills are very simple pieces of equipment. You slowly boil it. Things with the lowest boiling point come off first. That's your green grass, your herbal notes. Mm-hmm. That's acetaldehyde, acetal. You cut it, you throw it away. Those are your heads. Let it boil and it comes out in this order. If you come visit me, and I hope you do, fruity flavors comes next, then flowers, then the grain flavors comes after that. After 12 hours of boiling in a pot still, the soapy flavors are left in the bottom of the still. We stop the distillation, cut it and throw it away. So you can take away the green grass and the soapy notes and concentrate up fruity, floral, and the grain flavor. That's why I say, don't ask me how much rise in my whiskey. Ask me how much 4 ethyl mm-hmm. So you really should ask me how much grain is in your whiskey and how did you distill it? Distilling shapes your whiskey. Okay. Right. By doing that added pot still to lot 40, it concentrates those spicy notes up even more. Okay. Let me tell you, on the lot 40, I'm getting butterscotch on the nose, which I don't usually get on a rye. I usually get that more on a scotch. I was going to build that up is because we age it in brand new virgin oak. So you get those nice new notes that comes from a new barrel, 100% rye, pot distilled. Those are your three takeaways. That's the DNA, this and this. This is my flavoring whiskey, really. This is like a single malt is to a blended scotch, okay. right? This is the whiskey I would use to flavor lots of our other brands, right? Okay. This All is right. fantastic. Right. Cheers. Hey? Cheers. Yeah, cheers, yeah. And I thought the first dry was really good. Now I'm like, well, now I don't know which one's better because they're <laughs> so delicious. But don't you find this one a little bit more of that spice? I do, yes. It's a little bit of, it's a sharpness to it, I find almost, you know. It's got the more rye spice. So if I'm in a spicy mood, <laughs> then I think I'll have this one. And if I'm in a not so spicy mood, I'll have the other one. Back to J.P. Weiser's, established 1857. Is this one of the brands you acquired along the way? Yes, it is our flagship brand that we do have here. It's the largest selling brand in Canada. Mm-hmm. Weiser's so it sells uh, any other Canadian whiskey. In the U.S., it's not as quite as known. It originally, J.P. Weiser was an American who lived in Ogdensburg, New York, which is right on the St. Lawrence Seaway. Okay. He was a farmer. He, he was probably the, one of the most innovative farmers back in the 1840s, 1850s. And he bought a distillery across the river just for the purpose of growing cattle. He was the first North American to export cattle to the United Kingdom. Wow. He had over 50,000 head of cattle at one point. And he bought a distillery because he knew the waste out of that distillery would grow cattle faster than anything else. Because we take out all the starch and the sugars and everything during the fermentation process. Once you dry it down and the leftovers is a high protein feed, as you would know. And that's what he did. He was growing cattle. And then the Civil War hit. Suddenly, he became more focused on whiskey than the cattle business. So he became far more profitable. That's why he ended up starting to focus in on that. But the distillery had got purchased and bought through Prohibition because he couldn't sell few key individuals controlled the trade of Canadian whiskey during Prohibition, and he wasn't one of them. And we got gobbled up in between them, and the brand eventually got moved here to Windsor, Ontario, to the Hiram Walker Distillery. So okay. that's why it's limited here. But it survives. It survived, yeah. It survives and flourishes, yes. But yeah, I mean, it is a wonderful whiskey platform to work with in, in the roots of the farming and agriculture community. And he did buy a distillery for the purpose of growing cattle. And the th- cool part about this is we still do that today. Awesome. I mean, people walk into our distillery and smell the breadiness around the facility. And they say, well, I smell yeast. I love that smell. And what it brings to the operations, that's not yeast you're smelling. It's actually drying down the leftovers into distiller's dry grains. Nice. And it's the smell of money. (laughs) I mean, this is how we make our bonus. It's how we make our bonus every year because we trade it like on the Chicago Board of Trade as, as a key nutrient ingredient. So next time you have a piece of steak and a glass of whiskey, that's called the circle of life. Exactly. Uh-huh. Indeed. Yeah. The sustainability <laughs> can be profitable. Absolutely. 
<laughs> so, so the J.P. Weiser's 18-year. 18 18-year 18 is one that is a classic one. And I want Remember why I said we get extreme temperature changes here and we don't actually heat or cool our warehouses. So you get what you get. We have the oxygen barrels will expand and contract based on our heating and cool. In fact, our warehouses, the barrels are on standing up. Okay. They're on pallets and they're so packed tightly together, almost as a single organism. Mm -hmm. It will heat and cool together. Wood is a good insulator. And I mentioned earlier that the whiskey itself will drop it full of the freezing point of water. It is that cold in our warehouse, but our employees don't go walking in those warehouses or they die from asphyxiation. Oh, wow. That's how tightly in jam because the ethanol in the air. Right? So they all have to open up their big, they look like big garage doors to, to vent it out naturally without, with the outside air. And they vent it out before they go in and taking barrels out. Wow. And they have to wear an oxygen monitor. That's how intense it is, or they start to pass out. So the little alarm in case it gets above the threshold of oxygen. So so they'll vent it out on a one a day. It all of a sudden will turn 80 degrees outside, ice cold whiskey, got warm air going against it. All of a sudden, you'll see condensation forming on the hoops of the barrels. Mm -hmm. And I've had some of Scotland's top chemists come walking through our warehouse. And they go, Don, why are all the hoops on your barrels so rusted? I've never seen that before. It's because of our temperature change and allows the ingress of oxygen into your whiskey. And when oxygen touches ethanol, it converts it to a compound called ethyl acetate and acetaldehyde, mm -hmm. which gives a green apple flavor to your whiskey. Nice. So when we're going to try this 18 year in a sec, I often will say that's the taste of angel share. Ah. This is what happens in a barrel. You'll see it in highly aged bourbons, but it gets buried under the grain because they only single distill it once. This is a double distilled light whiskey. You'll get it in highly aged scotches. It gets buried under the peat, but it's there with Weiser's 18 year. This is the predominant flavor. This is what happens in a barrel. This is the taste of angel share. Cheers, eh? Cheers, Abe. Cheers. It's light and smooth. It's got a little tanginess. I think it's the, probably the apple flavor. That's that green apple. I call yeah. it Granny Smith apple. Okay. Yeah. Some people call it pear. I mean, teach their own what you want to call it. Mm -hmm. But this is the taste of age. To me, on the nose, this is a butterscotch bomb. Yeah. Oh, see, I don't get butterscotch on this one, huh. but I do get the apple. Yeah. I do get like the sour granny apple. I'm getting the apple on the palate. I'm with you, Philip. I get it more in the taste than the nose. Mm -hmm. But just recognize that taste. That's tasting age. Mm -hmm. And it's pleasant, yep. easy to drink. It's smooth. That's what I call as classic or traditional Canadian whiskey. Is this the same base as the triple barrel? Or is this a different juice altogether? Yeah. So this would be, except it's not 18 years. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. So that it'll be a, a good chunk of that's in the triple barrel, but not the full percentage of it, obviously. It is what it is. I mean, this is a sessionable, smooth, smooth whiskey. Yeah. Is this a 100% rye as well? Actually, it's 100% corn. I was going to say I didn't taste a rye in there. Wow. Okay. All right. So it's not related to the triple barrel. No, no, it's not. Okay. It is, stands out a little bit in that. So one of the things is this, and what I get a little educational wise with people. Remember where I said we single distill to make a rye flavoring whiskey, right? Yep. You can take that same distillate and you can run it through a second column still. Sometimes they call it the rectifying still. Mm -hmm. You probably have heard of that, that wording before. When you double distill it through two column stills, it removes all the flavors. So basically you're ending up with a light base whiskey. One of the things you got to be careful about when talking about the key whiskey category is we could put on the label that's 100% rye, but you got to ask the second question is how did you distill it? Right. If I double distill it through two column stills and make it from corn, wheat, rye, or barley, you won't be able to tell the difference. There's a competitor of mine in Western Canada that'll put on their labels and say 100% rye and you actually pick it up. I don't taste any rye in it. They're absolutely correct though. When you make your base whiskey, like like uh, grain whiskey for blended scotch, is they'll use wheat. They'll use the most economical grain that's closest to their distillery because they know they're going to strip out the grain flavor. So the most economical grain in our region is corn. We're in a corn belt, Midwest America, Midwest, right, mm -hmm. right there. So we'll use corn to make our double distilled light spirit. Right. Whereas in Western Canada, the most economical grain to make your light double distilled whiskey comes from rye. Okay. Ask a Canadian, what's your percent grain and how was it distilled? You got to be very, very careful with that. Okay. Does that make sense? Very much so. And this is magnificent, which makes even more sense. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is wonderful. This is wonderful. Yeah. I'm really, really glad you enjoyed it. This is a true standout. Yeah. It's smooth. I mean, and then that's the wonderful thing with a Canadian whiskey. We can adapt. You've had four different whiskeys. You probably can't even tell they're from the same distillery. They are distinctive one to another. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the power of blending. And that's why I made that whiskey flavor wheel that I made. 
it really does describe where those flavors come from. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. that's really what I think about at nighttime when developing whiskeys is how do I pull in flavors or how do I mask flavors or how do I remove flavors via distillation? Yeah. About six years ago, I penned an article for the Tasting Panel magazine, Mm. which had quotes from you, featured quotes from you. Mm. In it, I discussed both lot number 40 and Pike Creek, but not the Pike Creek we have in front of us for tasting today. Yeah. But this Pike Creek finished in port. The port barrel one, is it? Yeah. Yeah. With the twine collar. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. And I think that has my signature on it. I think it's the one, the only one that has my signature on it. Do you not make the port finish anymore? No. Back in the day in 2014, the definition for port changed. It changed. You could have made a port style wine anywhere in the world. In fact, we got a lot of our port barrels out from uh, California when we're making that release that Philip's talking about there. But the world recognized port as a distinctive one that has to be made in Portugal. So all of a sudden you're changing a brand on us. And Pike Creek wasn't a very large brand at that time. So we had to make a fundamental change because we couldn't find port barrels. Uh We had to buy a lot of port barrels from Portugal. They were in a demand at the time. Today, you could probably buy them now, but uh, at that time. So we actually shifted to finishing it in a Caribbean rum cask. We had some access to some Caribbean rum casks. And in this one, we actually have a mix. It has 80% Navy rum. The other way around, it has 80% amber rum, 20% Navy rum as the percentages of blend. They're all, the entire liquid is aged and finished in those rum casks. And that's what we chose to do at the time because we got caught. It's got some rum for sure. When you say Navy rum, you're talking about high overproof rum. In a barrel, they would be overproof anyway. Uh But yeah. It would be overproof anyhow for both of them anyhow. Okay. By the time they dilute it down. (laughs) Right. But from a barrel's perspective, it would have been overproof. (laughs) Philip, are you going to taste both of them? And if so, I'd like to know which one you like better. Oh, 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 I like both equally well. Actually, I tasted the port very recently when we started talking to Don about coming on the program. I like them both very much. You don't want to have a favorite? (laughs) No, but I don't have a favorite. You know why people often ask me when they learn that I direct the cocktail collection, they say, what's your favorite cocktail? My standard response is, as if. Why would I limit myself? As if. Yeah. Yeah, it depends on the moment, right? It does. It really does. What moment are you in? It really does. Yeah. It's funny. My partner and I, she loves rum. And I recently, before dinner one night, a few weeks ago, poured this rum-finished one. Also poured this Don Q rum finished in vermouth casks. Mm, interesting. Yeah, well, interesting. Wow. This is this is wonderful stuff. Anyway, huge rum fan. She had difficulties deciding on one or the other, whether she preferred the actual rum oh, really? or the rum finished Pike Creek. Yeah. Nice. I'm going to go with the rum finished Pike Creek. I don't have to ask. <laughs> yeah. Next time you're over. You can have some port finished, yes. Awesome. This one, I get an interesting, just uh, almost a licorice or a nice kind of to it today. And that's, I know that's the Navy rum barrel coming through on what I'm tasting today, more so at this moment, but. uh, Oh yeah. Oh yeah. That was a little bit of the tricky, the tricky part of it is how much Navy rum do you put into the blend and to make it an interesting flavor profile? Mm-hmm. You can tell I haven't enjoyed this at all. <laughs> either. The Pike Creek. For those at home, I'm showing on the video here, which you guys are not seeing. The 18 and the Pike Creek were broken into quite early. I just opened all the rest of the bottles. No, take it back. I had some of the old fashioned too. But the first three I just opened today, I think they're going to be emptier than the others very soon. They're not long for this world. <laughs> no. This is 100% rye. No, this one's a blend. It's got a little bit of rye in it. I don't like giving percentages because I blend the taste. It's okay. It's got a little bit of rye in it to give a subtle spice character to it, but largely it's the same base whiskey used for the 18-year. Ah. I was going to say, I taste a lot of the 18 flavors in that. Yeah. And in 10 years of age, you're going to start getting some green apple. Yeah. It'll be the same spirit. Yeah. Was that the same when you were making the port finished? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But in port barrel. So if you, when you're tasting the two difference, you'll see night and day on it. And then the Pike Creek, we did a release in last year, the Pike Creek Oloroso finish. Okay. 21 year old, won the Canadian Whiskey of the Year. Aha. Uh-huh. Wow. There will be a little bits of that released in the US. You'll have to check hodling.com. Mm-hmm. They have some of our limited releases on that one and it just goes so quick Yeah, as the Canadian Whiskey of the Year. That's the Pike Creek 21 all around. So check out hodling.com for that. And then there is also a Gooderham and Warts. They call it 49 Wellington. It's a 19-year-old whiskey that is phenomenal. Okay. Is that also in the US? It's also in the US. Okay. Check hodling.com for the availability okay. if you can find a bit. Right. There, those are some of our award-winning ones. We've We've kept to Canada only, but <laughs> we, we, we spilled a little bit into the U.S. And I shall say, too, going back to the Lot 40, I know this is largely an American audience, but the Lot 40 Dark Oak, I don't even have a bottle in my office. Wow. Just this week won the top rye whiskey in the world. 
So that's the first Canadian whiskey that's won the best rye whiskey in the world. Wow. Okay, we'll have to get that. And you say, and that's not available here? Not yet, not yet. That is not available in the U.S.? Not, not yet. I mean, it is designed to be a permanent release. Okay, all right. Very I good. mean, if you want to mail us a little wee sample. <laughs> <laughs> we just released it in Canada, and it sold so quick once the announcement came out last yes. week on it that the, the top rye whiskey in the world, my Instagram account, my Twitter account, people, where can I buy a bottle of it? People are just running to the liquor store so quickly to buy. But the difference between the lot 40 that you have in front of you versus lot 40 and dark oak, we took one extra step and aged it in number four charred casks. So it's double aged and it just gives you an interesting spicy smokiness layer on top of it. Mm -hmm. The people are just telling me, oh my gosh, that's the best ride they've ever had. Ever had that, I mean. So the Pike Creek, the Pike Creek is a 10-year-old. How much time does it spend in rum barrels? All it really takes is 200 days. And I'm glad you brought that up, Philip. I had intentions to diverting the conversation that way because <laughs> there is a little bit of a misnomer out there. A lot of people will talk about, I like my whiskey finished in a port barrel or Old Rosa barrel or whatever barrel for years and years and years because it pulls out more flavor. That's not the case. What that, re instead of finishing, the science word is called diffusion. Molecules by nature will go to equilibrium and they go to equilibrium really quickly. We wouldn't survive as human beings if that did not occur. Mm -hmm. If you have an in-room diffuser at home, molecules will disperse real quick and it goes to equal. Same thing with a barrel. So if you finish in a rum barrel, the rum comes out real quick. Probably within 200 days, 95% of it's there. Mm -hmm. So when people refer to that, oh, it pulls out more port or more whatever they finish into it, the longer it sits in the cask, that's not what they're tasting. They're tasting the evaporation loss. It comes to the wood. No, no. They're tasting the evaporation loss because uh, you've got this much rum and you're finishing the barrel, then over time you're losing, losing, losing. You're just concentrating it up. I see. That's really what they mean when they like things in a barrel for a long time. Mm -hmm. You might as well double finish. You might as well put it in a rum barrel again and put another barrel and you'll even have more rum or another port barrel, right? Okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Do you understand the concept of diffusion? Yeah, yeah. And what I mean by that? Uh -huh. So the longer it sits, it just concentrates the flavor. That's all it's doing. Plus creating yeah. green apple and aging. That's very cool. <laughs> That's the last state. Yeah. Yeah. Right, right. The name Pike Creek, what's the origin? Yes. It's the creek that goes beside our distillery. Ah, okay. Very good. So the brand was developed in-house. It was developed in-house in 1998 was the okay. original release of it. Oh, nice. Nice, nice. And then re-released the bottle you picked up there, Philip. That was 2012. And then, then we did that subtle change about 2015, 16 or so into the rum casks. And do you use the Pike Creek to fill as your water source or to power anything? Or is it just... In a roundabout way. <laughs> Our water comes from the city of Windsor, which comes from Lake St. Clair, which it drains into that lake. So okay. we use city water, obviously, when we're doing what we're doing here. So I guess in a roundabout way. Okay. Mm -hmm. In a roundabout. It comes from the same watershed. Yeah. 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 Well, cheers, eh? Yeah. Cheers, eh? Yes. Cheers. Yeah. Cheers. Cheers. I already had it. So you're a step... <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a step ahead of you here. Yeah. Mm. Mm. That's just so smooth. That's incredible. If any Canadians are on it, that tastes like a butter tart. Oh. It tastes like a butter tart to me, if anybody knows what a butter tart is. Okay. We have listeners in Canada. We have listeners all over the world. We do. But yes, it is. <laughs> it's primarily a U.S. audience, but uh, it is global yeah. by the numbers. Yeah. yeah. So bottled cocktails. I need to speak on bottled cocktails before we talk about your bottled cocktails. Okay. Most of them, I'm not going to pull punches here. Most of them are dreadful. <laughs> Most of them are what they call, you know, RTD. Uh, they're in cans, they're fizzy, so they're carbonated, and the ABV on them, 12 to 15%. When we first discussed this and you said that these are 70 proof, I'm like, okay, that's the proof more or less of your standard cocktail. Yeah. So they were already promising on paper. The fact that they were made by Hiram Walker. So talk to us about this. Yeah. So this is a JP Weiser's old fashioned. I've got to be honest, Philip, this is probably the best innovation that we've had in a long time at our distillery in terms of just on sales. I mean, we've done innovations of one limited releases, one Canadian whiskeys of the year, or world whiskeys of the year. That's one thing. But in terms of numbers and case sales, this one has been a winner. I get old fashioned on the nose. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> and a lot of orange. It's very bitters. I get bitters on the nose. Yeah. Oh yeah. We use orange bitters on it. Yeah. No, no, yeah. there's orange bitters in it for yeah. sure. Okay. And other bitter that I'll, I'll go nameless because it's intellectual property, the one you would use in it. Mm. It's also, <laughs> also there, but it is designed with some of Canada's top bartenders. 
So we went through prototype and prototype. They sat down at the table with us and they dialed up the orange essences, dialed it down. It needs to be this much sugar. They wanted to make sure they tasted it on the rocks because people would put an ice cube in it, obviously. All they wanted to do is people to be at their own home bartender, put your wedge in there of orange peel. I'm going to grab an ice cube. I'll be right back. Yeah. Although I've got a neat here. I don't have any ice around me. But it was really authentically designed with them. Mm -hmm. When designing products, My philosophy is listening. Mm -hmm. My philosophy is wisdom of the crowd, getting more input, whether you're a whiskey drinker or not, whether you're whatever. Bartender, I want your feedback. And this is where we ultimately landed on this one. You crowdsourced taste. Crowdsourcing, yeah. It was a crowdsource designed. Mm -hmm. And with some of the top bartenders, with our people around here who drink old fashioned. And I'm not going to lie, there was a fair number of prototypes that we went through. And I think we landed in a good, comparable place. Okay. Oh, yeah. That's fantastic over ice. At 70 proof, that's the authentic. I mean, that's really what one should be. Right. We didn't want it to be overly sweet. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think that's and the it's risk not. on this one. Yeah. It's very well balanced. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's not always, so yeah, the only thought we had around it is, do you put something like a lot 40 in it? But I said, no, we got to use what JP Weiser's tastes like. I mean, this is what we wanted in it. And we wanted to make sure it authentically met that brand. And I, I honestly think it does. And like I said, we have this one and we also have a Manhattan as well. I was just going to ask. It is or is not in the U.S.? Not in the U.S., but no, okay. we hope it's going to come shortly. And I'm going to promise uh, where it at. I think they want to see how the old fashioned does. And uh, okay. if it's doing anything like it does in Canada, then I would think this one will come along next. So, yeah. Nice. Uh, this is off topic a little bit, but the label. First off, I love your graphic design. Hiram Walker's graphic design is just first rank. But the label on the old fashioned cocktail is just out. Standing. Old fashioned. I can't take credit for that. <laughs> I can't take credit for that. Um, yeah, our brand team does a bang up job. Which of the JP Weiser's juices is in the old fashioned? And which is in the Manhattan? Weiser's Deluxe. Okay. Yeah, it's a Weiser's Deluxe that's in it. So Weiser's Deluxe is in the US market. This is what it looks like here. Oh, that's beautiful. This is our standard base brand. Mm-hmm. And is that a corn forward? Yeah, and a little bit of rye in it. Okay. There's a little bit of rye in it. All right. Yeah, and it's not all corn, there's a little bit of rye. And it's largely American bourbon barrels that are okay. engaged in. So what about the Manhattan base? Same base. Because oh, we, we okay. figured it's the same drinker. Same drinker will drink drink that. So that was the what was the thought behind it. But I mean, it is sessionable. We wanted to be authentic with it. I think you're kind of starting to realize that once we've come up with it. Yeah. And we're very, yeah. very happy. Very happy with it. In the Manhattan, we actually had to design our own vermouth, actually, that went with it. Ah, you anticipated the next question. That was a good exercise, actually. Uh-huh. Yeah, that was a good, good exercise. So are you selling the vermouth separately as an actual product, too, or no? No, it's in it. And I'm sorry, I'm looking around. I don't think I have a bottle handy here. Let's just see if I can find it. Uh, here it is. Here is what it looks like here. So, oh, it's beautiful. And is that a perfect Manhattan or a regular Manhattan or a dry Manhattan? What is that? It's it, it's not dry. It has a little bit of sugar in it. So, I guess is mm-hmm. that perfect? Is that what you mean by perfect? Perfect means a dry and sweet vermouth. So. Yeah, it's half sweet vermouth, half dry vermouth. It'll be a sweet ver sweet. Yeah, I guess. All right, standard. Yeah, yeah. Sweet yeah, and that's what we're shooting for on that. Did you work with a Canadian winemaker to produce yeah, that? Yeah, so no, they are. It's a winemaker that's from the Niagara region we're working with. Okay. We deal with wines in this facility as well. So we're taking some of the components from both and we're making our own vermouth with it uh-huh. and then adding our own herbs and stuff to it. Very cool. And are those the only two premixed cocktail things that you guys make there? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So speaking of cocktails. Yes, cocktail time. What are your go tos, both with and without Hiram Walker brands? In terms of cocktails or spirits? Well, in terms of cocktails, but you know, you may walk into a bar that doesn't have Hiram Walker brands on the menu in the inventory, as it were. I am a Manhattan drinker. Mm-hmm. I know what we're just talking about, man. I am a Manhattan drinker. I do. As am I. As am I. It's all good. You're in good company. Yeah. I, I mean, and I like my Manhattan's whiskey forward. Mm-hmm. I do like them whiskey forward. I go by the old standby the, as the same area code as Manhattan, 212, two parts whiskey, one part vermouth, two dashes of bitters. Mm-hmm. So I, I kind of stick with that. Maybe you make the Detroit, the 313, maybe three parts whiskey, one part vermouth. I don't know. That, that could work. That right. could work. <laughs> But uh, that would be probably where I go. And then maybe an old-fashioned, just like the two here. I'm not going to lie, too. I do like a good whiskey and ginger. Oh, yeah. That's good. I mean, that is a nice, refreshing cocktail. Mm -hmm. It gets hot here in the summertime. And by my pool, I I could drink those. I mean, not all day long, but they're (laughs) they're nice. (laughs) For an afternoon. I got to be socially responsible here. (laughs) Um, But, I mean, I do like whiskey and ginger ales. I mean, they're just... But I, it's got to be a rye forward whiskey I like with it. 
Like I, I go more to the JP Weiser's rye or the lot 40. If I'm making a whiskey and ginger, not so much uh, the Weiser's deluxe. I, mm-hmm. I don't know why I need that little bit of that extra kick of that spiciness for it. But uh, mm-hmm. yeah, that makes sense. Those are my go-tos. My devilish side. I do like peach knobs. Oh. <laughs> I do like peach knobs. Uh, uh, I don't know why. I don't mind fuzzy navels. I get into those. Okay. Canadians, I, do, I don't mind Caesars either. <laughs> In the wine fridge, I keep a bottle of Dauton peach liqueur uh, that if I just want that little bit of, for anything, I just, oh, let me grab a half ounce of that. Yeah, I, I hear you. I mean, there's something, uh, peach fruits are probably one of my fat, favorite fruits anyway. Mm-hmm. I do like I like that. that I know, know that's that's your one of the ones you don't want to talk about per se as a whiskey maker. And the other one, I'm a gin and tonic. Nice. I do like gin and tonics too. I mean. I like the Canada dry tonic. Mm-hmm. I'm kind of partially, although I haven't explored tonic. Go figure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah. I haven't explored tonics enough to know maybe what the right one okay. is. I, uh-huh. I, I, I'm still a little bit of a newbie a newbie at it, but I do like making yeah. gin. We do make gins here. Yeah. I have some thoughts and theories on gins I want to make. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Ahead. Can you talk about, we only have a couple minutes, but can you talk about that briefly? Because again, Hiram Walker is not just whiskey. Right. You make lamb rum, but talk briefly about the balance of the portfolio. Yeah, so Lamb's Rum is hard Newfoundland. Ah. I can define it as Newfoundland for you, and they get Demerara rums that they go into that. It's been a blend that's been, I mean, they sell more Lamb's Rum in Newfoundland in their liquor store. Half the store is Lamb's Rum. Uh-huh. Half the store is Lamb's Rum. That, wow. And it's because the trade. It was through the years and years and years of trade. Right. The Caribbean would have come up through the East Coast of Canada, and that's why it's still the sort of. Sure. Yeah. New England, New England and the Atlantic Coast of Canada was a center of rum making. Yep. Yeah. So we also at our facility makes McGinnis liqueurs. It's the same as the Hiram Walker liqueurs line in the U.S., but McGinnis was a famous Canadian during the rum running era. Mm. Nice. Mm-hmm. This is where Malibu rum is made. Okay. Oh, great. I don't know if you realize this. This is probably the number one brand at this facility is Malibu rum. So we bring in the Caribbean rum up here. Nice. And blend it all and bottle it and it gets distributed through here. I do like that rum. The other one, I have responsibility in our U.S. bottling facility as well is that I'm responsible for Seagram's gin. Oh, wow. wow. Okay. If you know Seagram's, I have the responsibility for that as well. Yeah, we've heard of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know you have heard of it. It's a rather large brand in the US. That is our mainstay. And then I really like that one because it's a nice lemon forward gin. And yeah. we do have a, a Quebec gin that uh, I have some ties to. It's called Ngava gin. I mean, we do make the whole portfolio. And the other big brand here that might get a little bit in the US is a brand called Polar Ice Vodka. Oh, yeah. Okay. We do make a vodka to here. Okay, so you're recognizing the brand. Yeah, yeah. It's got a big following in Canada and it's made at this facility. So, I mean, there's lots on my plate on any given day. I, we know how to make some of these spirits. And I, I mean, it doesn't really sound like it. I don't know what you're talking about. I mean, that's crazy. <laughs> ah, yeah, yeah. Underachiever. You're an under- underachieving, Don. But I'll, I'll say this is the people that work at the Hiram Walker here are probably some of the best spirit makers in the world. I really, really believe it. Don't doubt. I mean, I'd have to agree with what we just tasted. Yeah. I really believe it. And the talent here is amazing. And writers that come through, they're just completely shocked and blown away. Mm -hmm. Why didn't we know about this place before? And I think that's part of the challenge we have as Canadians is that I don't know whether we're too apologetic. We don't go out and tell our story very well. (laughs) (laughs) I I, I don't know. I don't know. But How stereotypical. Yes. But we got to go out there and tell, I mean, we do make some good stuff yeah. and shame on us. We don't tell it. I and mean, that's part of the reason why we're here today. And I'm going to say out of all of these, I think this is my favorite, uh, which is the lot 40. Shocker. Lot 40. Shocker. And then I think the second favorite is the triple barrel rye. Oh, good. Good. And then, but this old fashioned, old fashions are hard to make, to make them right. Yeah. As a bartender, I know this. So I'm pleased that I just have to put in a cube of ice and I'm good to go. So that's very happy. Yeah, it's and that was the idea. It's a lazy way of making it, right? Uh, and sometimes you are in those scenarios, right? I do take issue with the directions, however. It says, step one, pour 1.5 ounces over ice. <laughs> I've never heard of such a thing, but sure. <laughs> Enjoy your products responsibly. The optional orange peel. Yes. <laughs> okay. All right. But should say, and then repeat. <laughs> I think PR and legal weighed in on that, uh, on step one. Yeah. Yeah. Of course. And <laughs> if I can end with this, is that, uh, you know, I, I said earlier, I'm a passionate person with our category. I'm passionate about our brands. And uh, I'm very quite proud of the people that work here and what we can put on display for you. And if you really want to know more about Canadian whiskey, 
You can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, or LinkedIn at CDN Whiskey Doc. That's whiskey without an E. So it's CDN Whiskey Doc, and you can see all the good things. And I make announcements of where things are, when they're coming, where I'll be. Great. So if you're ever interested in doing a whiskey tasting with me, or if you even want to direct message me for a copy of that flavor wheel we talked about, I certainly can give you a link. Mm-hmm. But is Carrie's going to put it in the notes here? Yes. So you'll have it as well. Yeah. Great. Important to note, in Canadian Standard English, whiskey has no E. That's right. <laughs> and flavor has a U. <laughs> Which is the, one of the very many reasons why we have a parenthesis around our E in Spirits of Whiskey. <laughs> so so no. I'll end with that. Is if, I mean, I, like I said, please put a follow out there and we want to show what we can do for sure. For sure. Don, this has been a delight. Absolutely. Thank you for having me on. Thank you so much. Talk to you soon. Okay. World of Wheezy is up next. Stay with us. Hey, Louise, nice to have you on the show this week. This week, we are talking Canadian whiskeys. So out of all of the whiskeys that we gave you, which one did you want to do for the Canadian whiskeys? I am pairing the Pike Creek 10 finished in rum. Now... I was really... Oh, it's a good one. Yes, it's a very good one. I read up a little bit about all of them. You know, there are Northern brothers and sisters up there. As I was tasting all of these, I really wanted to do something with the Pike Creek 10 finished in rum. It made me think about how cold it gets in that part of Canada that part of the United States, if you're just over the border. And that always made me want to travel to the tropics when I was growing up. So here's what I'm doing. I am pairing this whiskey (laughs) with Mofongo. And if you are not familiar with that, Mofongo, Mofongo is a dish native to Puerto Rico, Dominican Republic. I'm sure that there are other parts of the Caribbean that serve this same dish, possibly by another name. But what it is, is it's fried plantains that are then pounded with a whole bunch of garlic and oil, sometimes animal fat. It's pounded into a mush, basically. And oftentimes you'll find it served with chicharron, which is the fried pig skin. So I wanted to do a little twist on this. I was thinking about doing a mofongo with fried chicken skin and then making some charred pineapple with pickled onions and pickled habaneros as a topping for this whole thing. So it's a little bit of a transport to the tropics because of that finishing in rum, all while still drinking a Canadian whiskey. Might sound crazy to all you people out there, but I'm telling you, as a woman from cold ass climes, this makes sense. Hear me out on this one. I know my peoples out there believe this. And if you've never had mofongo, look up your closest Puerto Rican or Dominican restaurant and go get some. It's quite delicious. You know what? I'm going to trust you on that because you come up with some pretty interesting pairing ideas and none of them have let me down. So I'm going to check that out. Yeah. And it's really an easy dish to make too. You just buy some green plantains, you fry them up, you smash them up. You do not need any special equipment. Normally it would be like a wooden mortar and pestle of sorts to pound this all out add some garlic add some olive oil and then make your condiments for it maybe if you have a grill going char up some pineapple pickle some chilies pickle some onions and you know chicken skins chicken skins are so delicious and so flavorful that if you're gonna bother frying chicken you can also bother frying just the skins in fact that takes much less time and also it had me think it was a little bit that kind of grooved a, with a little bit of like soul food action that would be going on in Detroit just across the border you know so all of that kind of worked for me I, I want to go there I want to sit in some blues club and eat this drink this whiskey and listen to some really good old school Detroit Motown or funk or soul and it can be crazy cold outside that's fine by me like this has you somewhere else so that's my pairing that's awesome i i can totally picture that right now awesome louise thank you so much as usual sounds wonderful and we will talk to you next week about our next pairing or next dish depending on what you feel like doing with it thank you so much as always it's a pleasure and i will talk to you soon For 
show notes on today's podcast, please visit our website at spiritsofwhiskey.com. That's whiskey with an E. We'll include links and supporting documents from today's stories in this episode's blog post. As always, you'll see upcoming topics, a guest roster, and links to past shows. Sign up to become a VIP member of Spirits of Whiskey. With your membership, you'll have access to listen to our series, The Malting Floor, be able to watch extra video content related to past episodes, and you'll enjoy access to our new web series, Tales from the Still. To learn how, visit our website and click on the pop-up button. If you run a whiskey club, or if you're a member of one, and you'd like your work featured in the Spirits of Whiskey Club Corner, send us an email via our website contact form, or leave us a voice message on our anchor page. Thanks for joining us. Until next time, Slanchava! Spirits of Whiskey is produced by First Real Entertainment and the Center for Culinary Culture, home of the Cocktail Collection, and is available via Anchor, Apple, Google, iHeartRadio, Spotify, and wherever fine podcasts are heard.